Welcome to the third dialogue of the War and the World, the ESP program where we have invited prominent speakers to help us look around the corner and see what the near future holds for global politics, economics and other re relevant fields. Today I have the pleasure to talk uh, about the future of the Russian economy with Sergei Guriev, Professor of Economics at Sciences Po in Paris and former Chief of Economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Thank you, Professor Guriev. Thanks, Sergei, for being with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. Let's, let's start from uh, the uh, current uh, crisis, the war. Uh, where are you expecting this conflict? Uh, and what is your take on the conflict so far? So I actually looked back and I saw that in my emails in days leading to war, I, I wrote to my friends and colleagues that the war is coming. But that was like a day before, two days before, or a week before the war. And at that point, it was uh, uh, not too hard to see that there is just too many troops and too well prepared. But I also have another piece of evidence. A year ago, we finished a draft of our book, Spin Dictators, which just came out this week. I highly recommend everybody to read the book uh, with Daniel Trisman. And so if you look at the draft that we finished a year ago, uh, there is no indication of the war. We do talk about the transformation of Putin's regime away from the regime being based exclusively on manipulation of information, on cooptation of the elites, on uh, covert uh, uh, limited repression. Uh, towards a regime based on fear, but we didn't expect the war. So in longer run, I didn't expect the war, and I still think it's a mistake. I think what Putin is doing is actually going to cost him a lot. His political life has shortened dramatically because of this invasion. Uh, the, the, and we get immediately to that, because the, the, we are, many countries are imposing unprecedented sanctions against Russia. Uh, nothing comparable to 2014. Uh, and EBRD uh, expects Russian GDP to shrink by 10% in 2022. Uh, do you think sanctions are really working? And would you agree with the 10% decrease in GDP that EBRD announced? Yes, 10% uh, is actually a mid-range estimate. So there are official estimates uh, within Russia which suggest 8%. There are also estimates from Institute for International Finance, uh, which suggest minus 15%. And there are still estimates from private sector investment bank, which are 10, 11%. So 10% is not unrealistic. Now, the next question is if sanctions are achieving its uh, goal. And that is a different question. Sanctions are working in the sense that sanctions are destroying Russian economy. They have destroyed Russian economy. But is that enough to stop the war? That's definitely enough to make sure that Putin's ability to prolong the war is shortened. It's also true that after this war, Mr. Putin will probably, if he stays in power, he will probably try to launch another war. And that next war will be much harder for him to launch because his economy, his army will be weakened. But here and now, today, to what extent sanctions are um, making sure that Putin stops this war? And this is a different question. And here, uh, the question is not to tell Mr. Putin, stop the war or your economy is going to be destroyed. The question is, we see Mr. Putin that you don't want to stop the war. So what we want to do is to deprive you of opportunities, of resources to continue the war. And for that, Europe uh, will have to go farther. Uh, will have to impose some kind of oil and gas embargo or a very high tariff on Russian gas or oil or both. And in that sense, this is the main game changer. If you want to um, finish this war sooner, you need to impose further sanctions. And these are not just sanctions on individuals, but sanctions on Russian budget, on Russian fiscal revenues. And most of the uh, fiscal revenue today is coming from oil and gas. And like European Parliament yesterday, we are talking on April 8th, on April 7th, European Parliament uh, voted with an overwhelming majority for a resolution requiring oil and gas embargo. And uh, Prime Minister Draghi, uh, two days ago, said a very important thing. He said, we need to make a choice between air conditioning and peace. And I think, I think coming from Italy, a country which depends so much on Russian energy, 
this is especially valuable. And so I guess the next question is for Netherlands and Germany. And Germany, by the way, has a similar level of dependence on Russian energy, um, like Italy. So in that sense, I think this is the next game changer. And this is what can force uh, the fastest uh, end of hostilities in Ukraine today. You, um, you actually anticipated my next question, uh, but uh, th that's the crucial point. Uh, I mean, the point is, uh, will, is what we are doing uh, enough to force Russia on the negotiating table? And your answer is not enough. Uh, we need uh, more on uh, gas, on energy, on other commodities. But Sergei, the, the feeling uh, you mentioned the European Parliament, and you are right, overwhelming in voting in favour, but the feeling in the negotiation among states, in the Council uh, and the Commission, uh, the, the feeling is that is still quite difficult. There are still resistance. You mentioned Italy uh, uh, saying something strong, uh, but Germany is still hesitant, others are still hesitant. So, w w and of course we are hesitant because we, while considering the consequences on the Russian economy, we have to keep in mind the consequences on our economy. Do you think we, this, this decision will be taken soon? What's your take on that? We also heard from Joseph Borrell, who said it's an issue of uh, when, not of if. And I think many things which we saw during those weeks, uh, in the recent five or six weeks, uh, have uh, gone far beyond expectations. Germany initially wanted to continue with Nord Stream 2. Germany didn't want to arm Ukraine and even ban transportation of weapons to Ukraine through its territory. Germany didn't want to increase defense spending. All of that has changed. And uh, honestly, I think the fact is that public opinion in Germany supports oil and gas embargo. German politicians may think that uh, the public is naive. The public doesn't understand that once we introduce the embargo, the economic consequences will be huge. But what is also true is my colleagues, academic economists of German origins, uh, German origin with German passports, immediately after the beginning of the war started to crunch the numbers. And two weeks after the beginning of the war, uh, there were estimates that suggested that, yes, costs may be sufficiently high, but not catastrophic. The maximum estimate they got was 3% of GDP decline, but more likely estimates were more like 1.5% one, one GDP decline. And then French and German uh, economists together uh, built another set of models to estimate country by country impact in Europe of uh, oil and gas embargo. All of those estimates are not catastrophic. And in that sense, I think, uh, yes, German politicians and European politicians in general are correct thinking about the impact on their economies, but these impacts don't seem to be catastrophic. And in that sense, I think uh, Joseph Borrell is correct. That's an issue of when, and I'm pretty sure that Europe will move in this direction. And every day as we accumulate evidence of Russian atrocities, and let's call it uh, what it is, uh, war crimes and genocide, shifts public opinion and therefore increases pressure on German politicians as well. How have the measure so far changed the daily life of, of Russian citizens? I'm, I'm asking you this because, uh, of course, you heard the, the latest Levada survey uh, uh, saying that Putin's approval rating has risen to 83%. Uh, so, why has Russian public opinion proven so far so supportive of Putin's choices? Uh, uh, and is there any difference between, uh, of course we know the difference between uh, uh, St. Petersburg and Moscow and the rest of the country, between generations in, uh, in Russia? So, there are differences between uh, urban and rural places, there are differences between young and old people, differences between people getting news from internet and from TV. Uh, actually, you mentioned young people. Among young people, half of young generation now uses VPN because after the beginning of the war, Putin closed down all independent media and uh, designated Meta, the company owning Facebook, as an extremist organization. In Russia, by law, today, uh, Facebook is equalized with uh, Taliban and uh, Islamic State. That's where we are. So... Facebook and Instagram are actually banned in Russia as well as Twitter. WhatsApp is allowed. 
how come uh, Meta being an extremist organization is allowed to operate WhatsApp, it's anyone's guess. But uh, in, 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 in any case, people uh, use VPN to get news. So uh, yet we do see this Levada survey. And one thing I would mention is when I talk to pollsters today, uh, they quietly complain that response rate have gone down a lot. So people don't want to talk to pollsters because it's now criminal to publicly say that you disagree with the official version of the war in Ukraine. So today we should be much more careful trusting this data. One thing which came out this week was a list experiment. I think uh, not everybody in the audience knows what it is, but basically a list experiment allows you to measure the average level of support um, uh, in a population uh, when people don't want to say whom they actually support. So the list experiment is when you uh, give people a list, say, of four issues. Uh, when you say, do you support uh, legalization of gay marriage, uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, military operation in Ukraine, uh, additional support of low-income Russians, and so on. So you give a list of three or four issues like this and ask, how many do you support? You don't ask... Uh, what you support. So I don't ask you if you support the war or not, but okay. I just ask you on this list, three or four or two or one. And then to some other people, I give a, the same list, but without the war. I'm going into this specific because I think it's very important. And then you ask people, okay, there is a list of one less uh, item. And then you compare number of initiatives supported in the list with the war and the, without the war. And that gives you the average level of support in the population because of a low of large numbers. So this experiment was run and we see that among people who agree to respond to polls, the level of support of the war is 68% in a direct question and in a list experiment, only 53%. So these numbers are still very large, but I think they will also come down further because um, people will start feeling the pain of the sanctions. So I don't want to go long on this, but I would just say that there is significant gap between what people say and what they think, and that's already been documented, and we'll see more of that. It was very, very useful, your explanation, and very thank you very much. Uh, a few weeks ago, you warned uh, that sanctions could worsen the global food crisis on top of everything we, uh, we discussed so far. Uh, do you already see signs of this occurring and what should we do to alleviate this problem? Yes, uh, we started talking about how sanctions or future sanctions may affect Europe. But it, there is a much bigger issue how sanctions may affect the global poor, the countries uh, which have low and middle incomes, especially countries which buy grain from Russia and Ukraine. And Russia and Ukraine are the biggest grain exporters. So the war will affect the grain market greatly. And uh, we already see complaints about this. We already see issues related to that. Um, and uh, the difference between Germany and Egypt is Germany has unlimited fiscal capacity. Uh, Egypt much less so. And so the world and the West in particular need to think about those issues very carefully, how the developing countries are hit by higher uh, oil prices and grain prices. And this is why we see some emerging markets saying, we cannot join sanctions. We cannot afford to join sanctions. We will use the situation where Russia is desperate to sell its oil at a discount price. So we'll use, we'll take that discount. So these are, these are the issues which are huge and we should not forget about them. This is a war in Europe, but this war affects everybody in the world me to the last question which is strictly linked to what you said i mean uh, uh, it's clear that there are countries in Af africa and asia uh, which are uh, worried uh, to be against russia we see it, we saw that yesterday at the un at the vote we saw that in previous occasion and we know that china and india are clearly not on the european or american side on this uh, in this crisis uh, so what does this mean in the future for the Russia economy? Uh, could China and India make up for Russia's losses in the Western market? And the last point, what's the future of the relation between China and Russia in your view? Right, this is the biggest question. And if you ask me for two game changers in this situation, one would be oil and gas embargo by Europe and the other is China. 
Uh, and it's China rather than India, which matters so much. Yes, India can buy in Russian oil, oil at a discount, but Russia needs much more than just a market for oil at a discount. Russia needs imports. Uh, Russia needs technology. Russia needs equipment uh, that it used to buy from the West. And now it needs to source it somewhere else. And so uh, China may imperfectly substitute some of that. So does China have semiconductors? Yes. Does it have semiconductors of quality that uh, Taiwan has? The answer is no. And Taiwan's uh, microchips are now out of bounds for Russia. Uh, will Russia be able to buy parts for its uh, Western airplanes through third countries like China? The answer is China said no. And the reason for that is China doesn't want to get secondary sanctions from the US. And the same will probably work for other countries around the world. Because this time around, we have seen uh, outrage in Western public opinion, which will drive American and European politicians to go after those players that facilitate uh, avoiding sanctions. And so China will be able to do a lot, but not everything. China doesn't have planes uh, comparable to Boeing and Airbus. Uh, China has cars, uh, which Russians will probably increasingly drive. But there are certain things that Russia needs to get from the West and will not be able to. Just to give you one statistic, in March, the production of uh, cars in Russia went down by almost three times because most of Russian automotive industry was part of uh, European value chains. And in that sense, the embargo uh, imposed by companies themselves, a lot of the sanctions were actually not decreed by Western governments, but were voluntarily imposed by companies themselves who wanted to boycott Russian, uh, Russian market, Russian money, uh, that already has a huge impact. And that is very hard to replace by, by Chinese companies. And the relationship between Russia and China in the future is anybody's guess, because China doesn't need this war. China is very much outraged by this war. Official Chinese position is China supports territorial integrity. Whoever recognizes independence of Donbass will next re recognize independence of Taipei. Who wants that? Uh, and uh, then the other thing is China publicly said it was not notified of this war ahead of time. And this war undermines Chinese eco economy because Europe, European economy will suffer. European economic growth is already downgraded in 2022 by 1.5 percentage points. That's really bad news for China because European market is a key market for China. So in that sense, we still don't know what post-war relationship will be. China hates sanctions. China doesn't like the West. But uh, partners like Russia are very costly for China as well. Thank you very much, Sergei. I mean, it was, uh, we went over a couple of minutes, but it was so interesting to listen to your answer that I was very happy to take some more time. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Russia be able to buy parts for its uh, Western airplanes through third countries like China? The answer is China said no. And the reason for that is China doesn't want to get secondary sanctions from the US. And the same will probably work for other countries around the world. Because this time around, we have seen uh, outrage in Western public opinion, which will drive American and European politicians to go after those players that facilitate uh, avoiding sanctions. And so China will be able to do a lot, but not everything. China doesn't have planes uh, comparable to Boeing and Airbus.